on a floor that has made most of the great stars of the NBA, Jason Tatum shines the brightest. Howard Beck, Locked On NBA Playoff Offseason Insider, joins me. It's Locked On NBA. It's now. Howard Beck joining me, longtime NBA writer, maybe three decades worth of NBA writing at the biggest names of all of the papers in the country, LA Times, New York Times, Sports Illustrated, Bleach Report, you name it, he's done it. I'm David Locke. I actually was the first ever host of Locked On NBA somewhere along the way. I'm also the radio voice of the Utah Jazz. We're going to touch on Jason Tatum's unbelievable performance yesterday. We're going to look at the coaching carousel that might just be about to go poof around the NBA, Nuggets and Lakers get ready to go. Oh, dear Memphis, what are you going to do? It's so sad, and you have no options. We'll talk about that, plus there's more. Warriors next step, lots of stuff going on. Howard, great to have you. This league has been made at the Garden. Like, that's – I know New Yorkers want to believe it's Madison Square, but it's actually the Boston Garden that's made this league, that's had this – where the greatest moments have taken place, where Johnny Most has screamed, he stole the ball – And Jason Tatum on that stage, on the Broadway of the NBA, was about, I mean, just flabbergastingly great yesterday. Uh, He was awesome. I guess if anyone's going to nitpick, David, they're going to say that uh, that garden is not this garden, and the Madison Square Garden is still at least continuously the same building, although they did gut it and redo it from the inside, but whatever. Uh, The TD Garden, not the Boston Garden. The parquet is the parquet. And symbolically, if not literally, um, yes, all of those legends have made their their names, um, including some opposing legends as well, of course, on that parquet. But what Tatum did, 51 points in a closeout, surpassing what Steph Curry had done in a, in a or in, in a game seven, I should say, surpassing what what Steph had done in a game seven just just a couple weeks ago. Um, absolutely incredible. On a day that that you are closing out the actual MVP of this past season, Joel Embiid, who did not play uh, anything remotely like an MVP, Tatum looked like the best player on earth for uh, for four quarters. And it, fascinating too, because I, like I, there were moments in this series where I wasn't sure where Tatum's head or game was, and that included most of Game Six before he suddenly in the fourth quarter of that game decided, you know what, we're not, we're not going down. And and that's going to be the one that's good. That 51 in game seven, we will all remember. And Tatum will remember and Celtics fans will remember for a very long time, but the Sixers should go into the off season, still haunted by what they, uh, the opportunity that they squandered on their home court in game six, because they had the Celtics on the ropes. They were at home. Tatum had had a flat game to that point, a non-existent game to that point. And they let Tatum go off in the fourth quarter. And the next thing you know, there's a game seven. And the next thing you know, the Sixers go from what seemed like a fairly competitive first half to, I don't, I don't know what happened. Uh, the, 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 the Sixers, it, it seemed like they just kind of like collectively decided it's, it's time to go on vacation. Every bad stereotype of the Philadelphia 76ers, of James Harden, of Doc Rivers, of Joel Embiid, surfaced in like three minutes and a narrative that is not going to die anytime soon whether accurate or not you could decide Jason Tatum might have just been so great that he broke their will but their will broke it it did but you know it also just looked like and maybe it is that right sometimes you're just taking too many blows and you're just like I, we can't keep up and then it just deflates the whole uh the whole collection of, of players there but I, I think I look at Harden and I look at Embiid and I look at just kind of the, 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 the body language of that team and their two stars in particular. And you just said it, you know, where this is only reinforcing all the skepticism we've ever had about these guys. It just looked like they had nothing left, whether that was physically, mentally, emotionally. Uh, it was just shocking how, how deflated and passive they suddenly looked um, as that third quarter started to develop and as the, the Celtics start pulling away, it looked like the Sixers had no will to counterpunch and they certainly have the talent to do. So now is this, a, is this just the, um, I don't want to start building an excuses for the Sixers, but is, is, is this just the, the uh, uh, you know, overall impact of Embiid playing on a sprained LCL it, for the last, however many weeks, you know, he, he sprains his knee in the, in the, in the tail end of the net series he presumably wasn't, you know, if, if, if it had been a, a normal part of the season, he could have been out. He would have just been resting for a month. Um, is it that? 
Is it something else? Is it that James Harden still doesn't have the stamina after all these years? Because we've seen this happen to him again and again and again. But here they were on the verge of, and I listen, I think about this in, through the prism of Harden more than Embiid. I know Embiid's the MVP. He's got he's the one with the target on him now. He's the younger one. Embiid still got plenty of years left to try to 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 you know change his postseason narrative. There have been circumstances. He's you know Doc said it yesterday, and I don't think Doc's wrong to say this. It'd be nice if MB just had one postseason where he was really healthy. And we can do the whole cliche about everybody's banged up this time of year. Yes, but there's degrees of that. And that was, a, 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 I think, a serious-ish knee injury that, you know, especially for a guy of his size who needs to do all the things he does and not just under the basket, but, uh, you know, up and down the floor and on the perimeter. That's a really tough one to deal with. Harden has no excuse in my mind, this, this, this was yet another version of Harden. Yes. He had a couple of great games in the series. He had, he had some outstanding moments in this postseason, but this, this is absolutely reinforcing everything that we've seen in a very long postseason track record from James Harden, where he repeatedly fails to deliver when his teams need him most. Harden's pretty interesting. No NBA finals. And yet probably a two or three year run where he was the greatest offensive player in the world. And maybe a two or three year run where he was like the greatest offensive player the game had ever seen. Like if you go back and look at those isolation numbers and what he was doing, like there was no, there was no one better. He kind of, he really altered the game in the same way Steph did. And yet there's no moment. There's no game. There's no win that you say put next to James Harden's name. No, we're going to remember his career the way we remember. I'm, I'm trying to think of like who the best comp is, but you know, like he, he doesn't play anything like Carmelo, but Carmelo is a guy who in his era was you know an elite scorer every team feared him every team's game planning for him and Carmelo Anthony made one conference finals in his career um and never really did anything of note in the postseason overall now that said at least Carmelo and I'd have to I'd have to look to double check this but off the top of my head I don't recall that we ever came out of any of those series thinking Carmelo didn't bring it right his other flaws in his game I you know I never thought Carmelo was enough of a playmaker enough of a defender um but I don't recall us ever coming away from a playoff series and thinking that his team lost because Carmelo Anthony was just seemed disinterested uh, or, or, or just flat. And that's the problem for James Harden is like, and, and the reason I, I draw the comparison, I'm just looking for another person of, of the last couple of eras who scored a lot, who's going to be on every all time list for all kinds of other reasons, but just doesn't have the postseason resume. That's, that's the first comp I think of, but that said, like, you know, Harden's extra burden is that he has, all these moments where it just seemed like he just couldn't even muster the will to come through. He just fades that I, I wouldn't put on Carmelo. I, I do want to say this. Like I, I have a page of notes from that first half. Like I thought it was one of the most fascinating first halves. I actually stopped the game with about four minutes left in the second quarter and went back and restarted watching it because there were so many strategy things there were all sorts of interesting things going on. Uh, like the Philadelphia had figured out if we come from the weak side on Robert Williams, he can't get back to where he's supposed to be. The, the Celtics were engaging and beating away. I mean, there was, and then it just didn't matter. Like at some point, you know what this is about? Like, this is about Jason Tatum going bananas. We can talk about Harden. We can talk like, it didn't matter what James Harden did yesterday. Jason Tatum went bananas in like a historically great manner in a game seven. None of the, we can, we can have all the other narratives, but like this right here, as much as I took irrelevant, throw it away. It doesn't matter. You go as far as your great players will take you in this league. Um, always been the case. And sure, like there are moments where, you know, you have like, you know, in the Celtics case, they're going to have like the Malcolm Brogdon game, right? Or the Lakers in, uh, you know, in this postseason, there was the Austin Reeves game or a Rui Hachimura game. But I mean, you know, there are those moments. I mean, role players really matter, especially the deeper you get. But generally speaking, especially in a game seven, you go as far as, as your stars will take you. And this is the contrast Tatum brought his absolute best when his team needed it most to close out this series and Harden and Embiid couldn't match it. Not individually, not combined. Um, Harden three for 11, three for 11, five turnovers, Joel Embiid five for 18, four turnovers. Uh, the problem is the 11. Yeah. The problem on the Harden number is the 11, not the three like balls sometimes don't go at the 11. Like you got to be like willing the game. Yeah. He's yeah. Howard back. He's one of the best NBA guys there is out there. He joins locked on NBA every Monday plus bounces around our local channels. He's our locked on NBA playoff and off season expert. There's a game of 
coaching carousel going on right now with great ones. Mike Budenholzer, Monty Williams, Nick Nurse. Is there a new one that's going to enter in? Land, where are they all landing? Is someone going to trade for a coach? Where you got nutty stuff that might happen here in the next two, week or two? We'll talk about that. Plus, who's the favorite in the NBA playoffs at this point? More coming up with Howard Beck here on Locked On NBA. Today's show is brought to you in part by Prize Picks. We've still got it for you the 100% deposit match at Prize Picks. Download the Prize Picks app at prizepicks.com. Use the promo code LOCKED ON and you got it. You got a 100% deposit match. Now, there's some other great things going on at Prize Picks right now. If you enter in on any given day at Prize Picks, one lucky person will be selected and that person has a chance to win a million dollars from Prize Picks. Here's what you do. You go to prizepicks.com slash million and you make sure you've entered in. And if you're selected, you get six pick flex and the following payouts, 1 million for six. If you get five of the six right, you get 80,000. Four picks right at 16,000. One person every day is being chosen to be a lucky chance to win a, be a millionaire, but you must uh, be eligible. You must opt in at prizepicks.com slash million. Prize picks, two to six players you pick. You can win up 25% of your money. You're not competing against other people, just against the projections. And you still have the locked on 100% deposit match. Go to prizepicks.com, download the app. First time users, you can receive 100% instant deposit match. Put in 50, you get 50. Put in 7250, you get 7250. Put in 200, you still get 100. So don't get greedy. All right, it is prizepicks.com. Download the app. Howard Beck is along with me. Howard, who is the favorite? <laughs> to win it all now? Yep. It's Boston. It was Boston, in my mind, the moment that the Bucks fell to the heat in the first round. And I actually was leaning Boston when the postseason started anyway. We were all debating, is it Celtics, is it Bucks? They seemed like the two strongest teams in the NBA period, not just the East, when the postseason began. And the second the Heat upset the Bucks, my first reaction was, this has cleared the path for the Celtics. Now, the Celtics still kind of messed around for a while there, and there were moments where it looked like they weren't going to survive. Um, first, they messed around with the Hawks, then you know, then you know the, the Sixers. Um, but the Celtics look like they're getting stronger as the postseason uh, progresses. The Heat are going to give them some problems because the Heat give everybody problems. The Heat are a pain in the butt in the best way possible. The Heat do not have the firepower to keep up with the Celtics. Like I know it's been a fun uh, joyride here. Um, I know we shouldn't underestimate the Heat at this stage, but the Celtics are by far the best team they'll have faced. I, I don't, I don't anticipate this is going to be a very long series. And then, you know, in the West, it's not that I'm underestimating the Denver Nuggets, who have been one of the best teams in the NBA all season. I'm not. It's not that I'm, I'm underestimating the Lakers, who I absolutely believed could make this run once they finally fixed their roster. But, and we'll get into to that. You know, the, the, I think like Lakers Nuggets a little bit too, but like. I just, I'm not, I'm, I am I have uncertainties about these teams that I don't have about the Celtics, right? What like, do you have that's uncertain about Denver? They've been really dominant, right? I mean, they, they have. The they, only games Phoenix won were when Devin Booker went ballistic. I'm going to say something obnoxious. You ready? Yep. You know, you, I, you know me, I'm not prone to hot takes and I'm not prone to, to being obnoxious about this kind of stuff. This is not to diminish anything the Nuggets have done so far, but. I don't think that they've truly been tested in this postseason. And now that happens when you're number one seed, right? You, when you're number one, you earn the right to blow the doors off some weak eight seed that's there just for the, so that the league can have games to play and have advertisers and money to make, right? Like the one eight is, is usually perfunctory. The heat upsetting the bucks, notwithstanding it's a rarity. Um, so that you're not going to be tested in round one, but in round two, you got a Suns team that was supposed to be, among the favorites, I, listen, one, I never bought into the Suns. So this is not me uh, re revising history. I never bought into the Suns, and I think you know this. But here were the Suns. They come in having this very short uh, you know, uh, run with Durant in their lineup in the regular season. And then they, the Suns themselves roll through a Clippers team that's completely broken in the first round. So even the Suns weren't tested in the first round. So I, I don't want to... We should not be building up the Suns and saying the Nuggets made had some great accomplishment by knocking out Durant and Booker. Durant, who at this stage of his career, um, yes, is capable of some dominant games, but he's not the Durant who was winning championships with the Warriors a few years back. He's post-Achilles, and 
he also didn't have that, that long of a run with the Suns for them to all get acclimated to each other. They had no bench, no depth, and then they lose their arguably third best player in Chris Paul along the way. Then they lose their fourth best player in DeAndre Ayton for the, for the closeout game. This wasn't a great team. Booker is great. Durant is great. But you know what? Durant and Kyrie are both pretty potent too. And they got swept a year ago by the Celtics of the first round when they were in Brooklyn. So when Denver wins this series in five and just wipes the Lakers of the floor, are you buying them? Well, yeah, of course. My yeah, point is they haven't been tested yet. My point is not to is it, the Lakers. My point is not to say I have doubts about the greatness of the Nuggets. My point is to say that we have not actually seen them tested yet. And I do think that Anthony Davis, who at his best is the best uh, defensive big in the NBA, and he's playing like that right now. That is the biggest test Jokic will have faced in this postseason for sure. The last time they faced each other in 2020, Jokic was not yet an MVP, so a little hard to, to, to judge through that prism. But it is interesting to look back at 2020. Anthony Davis in that series averaged 31 points on 54% shooting in that series. The Lakers won in five. LeBron averaged 27, 10, and nine in that series. LeBron's not averaging those kinds of numbers anymore. Um, and, 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 you know, maybe that gear is still there. We'll see. Uh, the third leading score for the Lakers in that series was Contavious Caldwell Pope, who's now a nugget. So that's fun. Um, Jamal Murray was the leading scorer for the Nuggets in that series. 25 points a game, 25, four and 70 average. Jokic was 22, seven and five. Again, not yet crowned an MVP. That would come the following season. Their third leading scorer of the Nuggets was Jeremy Grant, who's of course uh, now a, a Portland Trailblazer. Michael Porter Jr. averaged only 12 points a game. He was effectively a rookie then, right? He had missed his entire rookie season. That was his first full season. So he was, so Jamal, so um, Michael Porter Jr. has not yet become Michael Porter Jr. in that series. Jokic has not become this Jokic in that series. So it's hard to, to judge, even though it's only three years ago, the Nuggets are, are a much more advanced team and they now have Aaron Gordon. They've got different pieces. They've got Caldwell Pope. Um, both of these teams have essentially changed their entire supporting casts around their their two stars so i don't know that 2020 has any template to offer us other than i'm very fascinated by anthony davis versus Jokic because this will be by far the biggest test Jokic's face there aren't a lot of guys who can deal with Jokic. period in this league i'm not sure that anyone can honestly i think he's and that maybe not yeah. and i think i think the one thing that happens here so the what's interesting about this denver's the best offense team in the league they've been the best shooting team in the league for two years in a row their effective field goal percentage regular season this year was like nearly 58 percent. i mean it's a crazy number um they're just as good as shooters in the playoffs and then really what i think most people have missed on the lakers is since the trade deadline they're actually the number one defensive team in the nba and they've been the number yes. one defensive team in the playoffs here's the one thing i think happens Unless they can figure out the way to not guard, not have Anthony Davis guard Jokic, but I, I don't know how they're going to do that. Maybe he guards Aaron Gordon, and they just make Aaron Gordon shoot ten corner threes. Jokic brings Anthony Davis to fifteen, to eighteen, to nineteen, to twenty feet, and all the action starts to happen behind Anthony Davis. Sure, yeah. And I, the Lakers have got to find a way to avoid that because when you've got Aaron Gordon back cutting or Contavious Caldwell Pope, and also Jamal Murray coming off the handoff or this and that all going on at the same time because Jokic is the master. Anthony Davis suddenly gets frozen at 15 to 18 feet and the Lakers are in trouble. Darvin Ham's had a brilliant playoffs. He's going to have to find a way to keep Anthony Davis impactful at the rim in the way he was in that last series. And I know that Jokic is not your traditional back to the basket center who's going to stand there and, you know, banging on the low post, whatever. but Jokic is really effective as a scorer from close range. Now he also can shoot a little, obviously, um, but I don't know. I, I think maybe I'd rather have Anthony Davis guarding Jokic 17 feet out and Jokic orchestrating, and then you figure out how to deal with the backdoor cuts and everything else than I would dealing with Jokic versus somebody who's not Anthony Davis down low, right? Like, I, I, think, I think I'm think i okay with that. Um, but yes, sure, it takes Anthony Davis away from the basket as, as a rim protector. Uh, but, you know, as you noted, the Lakers have been the best defense in the NBA for the last couple of months. Um I, I like their ability to throttle Jamal Murray and, you know, uh, you know, keep Aaron Gordon from, from slashing to the hoop. Like though, I don't know. I, you think it's a short series. I, I think this one could, could go the distance. I think this is a long series. I, and and the, the Lakers have, you know, when it comes down to the core guys, LeBron James has won a bunch of championships and Anthony Davis has won along with him. Um, and, and this is, this is the biggest task that these nuggets will have had 
Um, this is a team that that largely does not have uh, this this degree of, of experience at this level. Like, is this an experience series or this is just a, a talent experience uh, talent series? Is it a youth versus old legs series because the Lakers still need to get a lot out of LeBron and Anthony Davis? Um, I know I know Anthony Davis isn't that old, but he feels old with all of his injuries, and LeBron certainly is. Uh, I, I I think I think this could be a, a long series for sure. Um, I'm I, I think it's a to me it's a coin flip. I don't even know I I, I don't know who's coming out of this series. Uh, I'm I'm confident in the Celtics coming out of the East. I'm I'm confident in the Celtics beating whoever comes out of the West. It's interesting. I'm not hopeful that either of these are going to be great series. Like I kind of feel like mm. Miami and the Lakers have put everything. Now the fact that Miami got a few extra days off might change that. I feel like those two teams just put everything they got and that they just might not have a lot left. Like this is really exhausting and really tiring. We'll see um, on that. All right. We do, do we're going to do coaching carousel and then some rapid fire, quick, quick hits with Howard back here of locked on NBA playoff insider and off season expert here on locked on NBA joins locked on NBA every Monday uh, Jackson Gatlin's got his regular show up for Locked On NBA, running through the three biggest stories of the week. And then the regular crew comes with you with a lottery party. By the way, lottery party, six o'clock or eight o'clock Eastern on the Locked On NBA YouTube feed. All of us hanging out. We get voted off in Survivor Island every single time one of our teams show up and we have to leave. It's sad. It means we don't get Victor. It's all coming up on Locked On NBA this week. Howard Beck is along with us. All right, Howard. Place place the coach. This is craziness. All right, Monty to Milwaukee. Nick <laughs> Nurse, just, Nick Nurse to Phoenix. I, listen, Mike Tony to Philadelphia. I, I know. Rivers to ESPN. Yeah. Does Tyrone <laughs> Lou stay in LA, or does somebody does somebody acquire Tyrone Lou from the Clippers? Like, what's about to happen here? Oh man, I do not recall in my time covering this league. This is twenty six seasons, not quite thirty yet. Lock right, twenty six. So. Um, I 30. I mean, I was only putting you on my left. Like I got I started 30. in 97. So I started in 92, three. Yeah. Um, so I do not recall an off season. Yes. We're used to having a coaching carousel in the NBA and there are, there are seasons where it's just a bloodbath and everybody gets fired. Um, there are and seasons where there's only a handful. I do not recall a scenario where literally I think three of the best coaches and three of the most recently accomplished coaches, right. I'm talking about Bud, who won a championship, Nurse, who won a championship, Monty, who was in the finals against Bud. All three being out at, in the, at the same time and potentially all just trading places in some fashion or another is, is just bizarre. And I know that it's, it's kind of the way of things in pro sports. Often coaches, they get fired by one team, they're immediately hired by another. Like, that's normal. But three, of, three guys who have all been to the finals and or won a championship in recent history who could all just switch jobs is very strange. Um, and then on top of it, Doc, who obviously is very accomplished himself, uh, not not yet fired, not dead yet. Um, not so as, like, not as of recording, not as of as of, uh, you know, 923 Eastern on Monday um, to, to, to give things away to the listeners. Um, maybe that happens. I know he's been on the hot seat for a while uh, and Daryl Moore didn't hire him. And, and the Sixers have a lot to consider right now. Um, and then Teron Lou. Here's the interesting thing on the Lou front. He's been speculated about with all these jobs, despite the fact that he's still under contract with the Clippers. The reason for that, that I don't feel like has been stated much is there have been rumblings for a while that, you know, not from the Clippers side of it, but that Lou himself might be getting impatient with the situation there that it's been wearing on him that he never has his stars available and, and who could blame him. Right? So if Lou is available, it's probably because, and again, I, this is just rumblings. This is not, I'm not breaking news here. Don't aggregate this. Like, but my understanding is that like, there has been some concern on Lou's part about just the state of affairs there with Kawhi Leonard and Paul George never being available, which would be totally understandable. So if somebody comes for him, I don't know the Clippers are going to want to let him go and they don't have to, by the way, but maybe it's a situation like when we saw Doc go from Boston to the Clippers where it's, you know, draft compensation or something. And yes, I could absolutely see uh, the Raptors, the Suns, the Bucks all be interested. Like if you saw, if tomorrow, if if Phoenix acquired Tyron Lue and Nick Nurse became the head coach of the Clippers, back with Kawhi, Kevin Durant with Tyron Lue, like none of us would be, be like yeah. stunned. And like, is yeah. that, that's the way to say it. Like 
It sounds crazy. None of us in the circles of like where the murmurs are happening would be stunned. Now, Nick Nurse could end up in Phoenix as well. Um, we interested to see what Milwaukee does. You fire Mike Budenholzer. It's hard to find a coach with a better resume or than Mike Budenholzer. That that's going to be a hard one for Milwaukee. Like, well, yeah. yeah, and and you and I both you and I both know this. Like, it, it's not always about um, finding a a better coach. Like, you know, yes, tactically speaking, is there anybody better? And it's not always that. Sometimes it's just a matter of you just need a different voice. Uh, you just need a refresh. And you know, I, I don't think the Bucks are trying to find a quote unquote better coach than Bud, but maybe a better fit or a, just a different voice. Uh. And then Toronto, who they hire, is still kind of out there. Uh, let's go rapid fire for to wrap this up. What do the Golden State Warriors look like on opening night next year? First order of business, re-sign Bob Myers, whatever it takes, so that Myers is then the one to deal with the very delicate Draymond Green and, and Clay Thompson situations, right? Both of them eligible for extensions, and in, in Draymond's case, he could also opt out. You want them back, but you want them back without having to extend them on max deals. And I'd rather have Bob Myers uh, smoothing those the, that negotiation than somebody else. But I think all those principles are back next year. Myers, Kerr, their core three guys. The question is going to be what they do with Poole. Can you get value for him? Do you trade Kuminga in an effort to uh, replenish other aspects of your roster? Would you put Moody on the table? Would you put Wiggins on the table? Uh, but I think the core of the Warriors is back. Does Tom Thibodeau coach the New York Knicks next year, the whole season? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I mean, look, they, they overachieved this season by far. Their season was an absolute success. No matter where they went out, the fact that they were in the second round at all, the fact that they were even the fifth seed in the East all exceeded expectations. Certainly go back and look at all the preseason prognostications, the odds, everything, um, which I think buys him a lot of latitude. And I do think, their difficulty, their challenge this offseason is they this as, as per usual, this is what Tibbs does. He gets the absolute most from your team or more than could be expected. The problem is then it raises the bar. And I don't think the Knicks have any further to go with this. Like they, they do have some young guys who can take other steps, but you really don't have a superstar to build around. Uh, Jalen Brunson's now playing like one of the best point guards in the league. So that's a great start. But Julius Randle, keeps doing this thing where he fades in the postseason. You can't count on, on him being the other star. So you need you need somebody. And I don't know how you get him. Every Knicks fan, I'm in New York, obviously. Every Knicks fan in New York wants to throw Julius Randle overboard right now. But Julius Randle plus stuff, plus other young players or picks or whatever, is not getting you your second star. Right? Like that's, that's the thing that's being bandied about. But nobody in the league is fooled by Julius Randle any more than Knicks fans are fooled by Julius Randle at this stage. Do you have any feeling? I don't know if Rudy Gobert and Donovan Mitchell were surprises, but I don't think if we were sitting here on May 15th last year, we would have expected both of them to be traded. Like, I think I expected would, one. I, yeah. I absolutely expected at least one of them to be traded. Yes. Do you have any feeling on what the next marquee name to be moved is and when? The guys that I think everybody is keeping an eye on around the league are in no particular order and in no particular likelihood, right? There has been some Trey Young discussion. I think probably that's it's too soon for that. And I think even the people who are speculating on that understand it's too soon for that. But that's one to keep an eye on. Carl Anthony Towns is one because um, we still aren't sure if the if the Towns Gobert thing is going to work. And they they can't they they gave away too much to get Gobert to trade him. He's the guy who's going to anchor your defense. Anthony Edwards is there to stay. Well, if you're going to move forward, if you're going to make anything, if you're going to do anything dramatic in Minnesota, maybe they will, maybe they won't, but Towns is the guy to keep an eye on there. And then, and that's a situation the people around the league have had their eyes on. If Harden leaves Embiid, if Harden goes back to Houston as rumored, does that trigger a Joel Embiid? It's time for me to move on as well. That's that like that one's further, further out there on if we were ranking these, but again, it is something that people around the league talk about. Is it, are we coming to a point where Joel Embiid's going to be frustrated enough to want to leave Philly? It's just a it's just a question. No one's saying it's likely. No one's saying they think he's going to. It's just this is something that people around the league keep an eye on because this is what this is what people around the league do, right? It, especially people who are like the pro personnel guys whose entire jobs is to, to try to figure out who's available and when and whether they're a good fit with your team. Those are the guys. I don't think I'm missing anybody. Like we're when we're looking for just discontented stars or or shaky situations, I think that's the group right now. And I'm 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 gonna. Glance the and the question is whether you include Luca. I don't think we're. I don't think we're there yet with Luca. Um, I I think if that moment's coming, it would be you know a year from now if things are still 
really bad there if they haven't found any any uh, real support for him. So, um, no, the, the Luca one, I think, is is way, way, way premature. Final two. More surprised if James Harden's wearing a Rockets uniform or a Sixers uniform next year. <laughs> uh, I'm going to say it this way. I will be more surprised if he's wearing a Rockets uniform only because – my view, and it's not my career to decide, it's James Harden's career to decide. But in my view, his best uh, his, his best path forward at this stage of his career is, is to stay with Joel Embiid and, and, and put the onus on Daryl Morey in the front office to do whatever else you can to, you know, upgrade the roster or whatever else. And I'm not saying it's not on the stars. It is on the stars. But, like, Harden and Embiid need each other. And if Harden's going back to Houston, he's basically – if I'll just say it like this, if James Harden decides he would rather be in Houston, I don't think it's unfair to conclude that James Harden doesn't care about winning a championship in his career. Okay. The, Rock, the Rockets are nowhere near ready to compete at that level. Nowhere near. He's going to a young rebuilding team with some young talent that has some promise, but also some definite concerns. If he goes back to Houston, it's it's for comfort and lifestyle and everything else other than basketball. And it means that he is leaving the literal MVP of the league right now to go play with a bunch of young guys who aren't ready to win yet. And he's not at a stage of his career that he can be the one to anchor them and lead them either. Um, so because of that, and because I would like to believe that James Harden is more interested in winning, I think he's more likely to be in Philly. Final minute with Howard back. Uh, my wife, who is a 20 year sports reporter, might have summed this best up yesterday at Mother's Day at the table. when I said, oh, dear, what does Memphis do? And she said, well, they've got a real pickle. Uh, <laughs> uh, what does Memphis do? Remember when their biggest issue was what to do about Dylan Brooks? Um, that was nice. That was, that, that was, was last week. Yeah, that was cute. Um, man, uh, I do not envy anybody in that organization having to deal with this. Um, you know, there are sometimes there are problems of your own making as a team. This is obviously not that, uh, John Morant. I mean, I, I, first time I've ever can recall again in 26 years covering the league that somebody had to suspend a player during the off season. I don't even know what an off season suspension looks like other than I guess you can't come to team facilities, which maybe he wasn't anywhere near anyway. Um, I, he's going to, he is certainly facing a suspension from the NBA this time, not a team suspension, but the league is going to be the one to, to drop the hammer. Um, so now it's affecting next season. You're not trading him. He's one of the best young players in the NBA. And, and, and he's a spectacular player besides, um, you know, not just competitively, but obviously visually, like he's, he sells tickets. Um, and, and like no amount of mobilizing, you know, your, your, your support staff and getting a guy help counseling, whatever this, that, like no amount of that changes or, or can, it, can change what a guy wants to do himself. Right. If John Morant wants to be, cruising around flashing guns on Instagram live as he's now done twice. I like you, there's only so much you can do. He's a grown man. Um, he's either going to get it together or he isn't. And I think the best, the only thing the Grizzlies can do is take a deep breath, be patient, offer all the resources available, have all the conversations you can have. But I don't, I don't know that there's any other, like wh wh what can you do? You Market ride this out. <laughs> What's that? But they're marketing Jaron Jackson Jr. for this offseason. Like that's well, what they yeah. do. like that's really it. They have no, they can't you're right. No, you're 100 percent right. Like he's too good. You're not moving him. You're not moving him on a 10 cents on the dollar, though yeah. 29 teams would acquire him right now. Um, it's like, and I think you said it well, it's not of their making, which is too bad because Taylor Jenkins is one of the three or four best coaches in the league. That group, that front office has done a brilliant job, and they're just in a pickle. They're in yeah. a terrible pickle. And I mean, obviously you don't want John Mar John Morant's playing, you know, I don't know if this is probably not the right phrase, but it feels like he's playing a little Russian roulette with like his own safety. Um, and so let's hope he's not. It's, it's sad and alarming. It's sad. And, it was sad and alarming the first time it it's, it's, it's profound. <laughs> I need adverbs profoundly sad and alarming now. I mean, I, I just, it, it I, I, I did not see that coming, David. I, I saw that over the weekend, like everybody else, and my jaw dropped. I, like, again? Really? Right. Oh, my God. Uh, that is Howard Beck. You'll catch him throughout the week on our Locked on NBA shows. We'll back you with you. He'll be back with you Monday with Nick Angstead next Monday. 
Thank you very much for tuning in. Thanks for being in every day or on Locked On NBA and on your team's podcast. It's the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.